feel the power. Welcome to Righteous Invasion of Truth with Dr. Abel Damina. Hello there, welcome to the ever-increasing word feast. Abel Damina is my name. Always a joy and a pleasure to feed you with the word of his grace. Brother Paul says, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you your inheritance among the sanctified. I want to welcome you to this broadcast today. Listen very carefully. This broadcast today is intended to bring you the revelation of Jesus in all of his purity. But I'm also aware that everybody that comes into this page is not coming for just the revelation of Jesus. He's coming for other things. So listen carefully. This is a buffet. Whatever you're looking for, you will find it here. If you're looking for grammatical errors in my preaching, you will get a lot of them. If you're looking for something to criticize, you will have a billion and one things to criticize. If you're looking for my imperfections, they'll be very obvious today. That's my prayer for you, that you will get whatever you're looking for in this broadcast. And if what you're looking for is Jesus revealed in all of his purity, you will also find that in the expounding of the word of his grace. So hey guys, the buffet is getting ready for you to jump in. Grab what you came here to look for. Let me also mention that there are books of mine that will do a lot of service for you. A lot of you that have questions, you're seeking to grow, you're sincere, you're honest about the things of God. You know, this one is don't pack your bags yet. It unveils to you finding and engaging purposeful living. This one is welcome to God's family. This is a bestseller. It deals with knowing your rights, privileges, and responsibilities in Christ Jesus. There's another one praying in the spirit, building up yourselves on your most holy faith. This will be a very powerful resource for you as you seek to grow in the things of the Spirit. Oh, this one is very critical. Evangelism in this year of training, evangelism and discipleship. You can't do without this book. Evangelism. Are you ready? Here's what you need to know. Half of this book is dedicated to answering questions, commonly asked questions during evangelism. Very, very powerful. A lot of exegesis here that will help you to be able to answer questions as you go to preach Christ. Finally, Revelation Knowledge, Knowing God in Christ. These are my new books, and there's a lot of plethora of books here you can order and get for yourself to equip yourself so that you can grow in the things of the Spirit. Finally, the local church is so critical. The Bible tells us God sets the solitary in families. The local church is God's device to build up believers, to grow believers. He gave gifts to men when he rose from the dead. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastoring, teachers for the equipping of the saints to do the work of the ministry. The essence for the local church is to equip you so you can do the work of the ministry. But remember, the local church is a place where selfishness dies. It's a place where you give yourself to service. Number two, the local church is a place where you receive ministry. So because you're going to be receiving, pride dies. It's God's device for destroying selfishness and pride. You give yourself to service and you receive ministry from the ministry gifts and from the brethren within the local church. It's so important that you belong to the local church. The Bible tells us you do not dismiss the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. However, if you've been following my teachings and you live in a place where there is no Christ-centered church to belong, you can join one of ours or you can start one today. You're looking for a Christ-centered church, just shoot me a mail, Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. Or you want to be a part of our campus that is closer to you. Send me a mail today. I will be glad to share with you and to help you locate a Christ-centered campus where you live around the world so you can go and fellowship with brethren, join the brethren, grow together, evangelize together, bring people to the kingdom and watch them grow into maturity. That's the whole essence. Of ministry. I always say the fruit of ministry is ministry. I'm glad to welcome you to the broadcast again today. We're going to have a blast as we study the word. Let me advise you, however, get ready to unlearn so you can relearn the word of his grace. It's so important. And if you have questions in the course of teaching, don't be in a hurry to ask. Be patient. Let the whole series be completed. 
then if their questions are not addressed, you can come forward with questions. Because sometimes when you start worrying about the questions, you get distracted from the flow of teaching. And you can even be worrying about the question and that same question has been answered. But because you were distracted, you didn't listen carefully. So pay careful attention. You know, the Bible tells us that one of the problems of the last days is that many will not endure sound doctrine. So there is an endurance required in doctrinal teaching of God's word. There's endurance required. So I want to employ you today to endure and be patient. Let the word build you up. Let the word equip you. We love you. I'm excited. And like I said in the beginning, whatever you're looking for, you'll get it in this broadcast. If you came to look for my grammatical errors, you'll get a lot of them. If you came to look for something to criticize, you will have a lot of it. But if you came to get the purity of Jesus Christ, you will find it right here on this broadcast today. So fasten your seat bells and welcome to the buffet of God's word. Amen. Amen. Second Timothy 3.15, Soteria, season 5. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And we took time to see that faith in Christ is faith in the blood, faith in his walk. Romans chapter 3, verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. Now the righteousness is unto all and upon all them that believe. They have to believe for it to be unto them and upon them that believe. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Yes. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Yes. Whom God had set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his through blood. Through faith in his blood. God had set him to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. Unto them and upon all them that believe. Very important. The faith has to be in his work. Not just to say I believe in God. That's lame. Even demons believe. Not to say I believe in Jesus Christ. That you believe that there's somebody called Jesus doesn't get you saved. What gets you saved is faith in his blood. Faith in his blood is faith in his sacrificial work. Faith in his sacrificial work. Not just saying I believe in Jesus. I believe there is God. Even the devil believes and trembles. That doesn't get you saved. True salvation is in his work. True salvation is in his death, burial, and resurrection. That is where true salvation is found. Salvation is a product of Jesus' work. When you believe in his work, then you are saved because of his work. That's why brother Paul will keep saying this over and over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 14. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. And if Christ be not risen... Then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Your believing is useless if it is not predicated on his resurrection. If your believing is not in his work, in his death, burial, and resurrection. Even if you say, I believe God, and tears are coming out of your eyes, it is useless. Your faith is vain. You are yet in your sin. So you are not born again just because you attended a church or came out to an altar call. You are born again because the work of Christ, his sacrificial work has been understood by you and now you have faith in the fact that he died on your behalf, he was buried on your behalf and on the third day he rose again on your behalf. Faith in that sacrificial work is what gets a man saved. Verse 17. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. If Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, empty. You are yet in your sins. So that you believe in Jesus is not enough. That you believe in God is not enough. That you believe that there is God is not enough. You are still not saved. Salvation is faith in his blood. Faith in his blood. Because the blood was shed for the remission of sins. Faith in his blood. That's very critical. That's the basis for salvation. Able to make you wise unto salvation through faith. Faith 
in his blood or faith in his work or faith that is in Christ. Who is Christ? Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That is the basis for salvation. That's critical. Jesus being our savior. The word savior is the Greek word sota. It's taken from the Greek word sozo. Sozo is the action. Sota is the actor. So Jesus is the actor of salvation. So we call him savior. That word savior means it is his function. Savior is the office of Jesus. His present day ministry. His present day ministry as savior who functionally saves. That is his present day ministry. He is our savior. And we did exegesis from First Timothy chapter 4 verse 10. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach. Yes. Because we trust in the living God. Yes. Who is the savior of who all men. Who is the savior, the sota of all men. Especially of those that believe. And this morning we took time to say that word specially is not English. That word specially is not the same specially with English specially. The word specially there means specifically. Or the savior of the whole world. I am referring to those who believe in him. That's the word specially there. And we did some exegesis. I wouldn't want to go through that again. But he's the savior of the whole world. Specially or I'm referring to those who believe in him. Those who believe in him. So a sota is not just somebody who does it at his own pleasure. Okay, it was used before Jesus came as the office, the office of a king who has the responsibility to protect the territorial integrity of his society. A king, because as a king, it is the responsibility of the president or the monarchy of a nation to protect the integrity of that nation from danger, from invaders, from punishment. The word savior was not a coinage of Jesus. It was already used before Jesus came for kings and princes who had the responsibility of protecting their territory. So when we say Jesus is savior, the reason why the writers of the Bible use the word savior for him is to describe the functionality of his office. That as a savior who provided salvation, it is the sole responsibility of the sota to protect the saved from danger, from punishment, and from invaders. It is the job of the sota. Jesus being the commander-in-chief of salvation. can brag and say nobody can pluck you out of my hand. Why? He is exercising his office as the commander-in-chief of salvation. Batolaba. Nobody, nobody, no devil, no demon. He is the sota of sozo. And he is the supplier of soteria. He has the sole responsibility of protecting the territorial integrity of the product he has offered to mankind called salvation. So salvation is to deliver you or free you from danger and punishment of sin. When you read the body of Christ in the Bible, it is not used for the church. In the four gospels, and it's not used at all. The word body of Christ is never used at all in the book of Acts. And it's not used by other apostolic writers. Only brother Paul used the word body of Christ. Peter didn't use that term. James didn't use that term. Jude never used the term body of Christ. The writer of Hebrews never used the term body of Christ. So only brother Paul used it. That means brother Paul alone will be able to explain what it means by the word body of Christ. But primarily it is used for function. Function. When he's describing the body and talking about the hand, the leg, he's dealing with functionality, the functioning of members of the body of Christ. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 to 12. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for Next the perfecting verse. of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. For the perfecting of the saints, 
for the edifying of the body of Christ. The word perfecting is not maturity, even though it includes maturity. But the word perfecting of the saints is not maturity. It's the word katatismo, katatismo in the Greek. It means to fit parts together to walk, referring to the physical body or the body of Christ. Putting every part together in its functionality to walk. So part talks about ministry, ministry. Every member of the body of Christ has a ministry. Every member of the body of Christ has a ministry. That is why we perfect you, you do ministry. We perfect every one of you as a saint, saved, sanctified by Christ, to do the work of ministry so that the entire body is edified. Is it clear now? Is it clear now? So when we say body of Christ, we are talking about the functionality or ministry. That's the meaning of the word body of Christ. And it was used only by brother Paul. When you get home, you can read if you want further study. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Ephesians 2, 16. Ephesians 4, 15. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. Baptized into one body. Talking about the body of Christ. Talking about ministry. So when we say Jesus is the head of the body, what we are talking about is that Jesus has a ministry to the body. Jesus has a present day ministry to the body of Christ. The sota, the head, has a ministry to the body of Christ. Remember, sota is a function or a functional practice. It's not an award. Sota is not a title. Just like some people have a title. You know, they call you chief. But you're chief in nothing. But people are calling you chief. Sometimes somebody will look at you and say officer. But you're an officer over nothing. It's just a title he gave you. A personal award. It has no functionality. Now, the word SOTA is not an award. It's not a title. It's an office. It's an office. Like you call me pastor. It means I have an office to you where I provide you pastoral service. Just like Jesus is the head. The headship of Jesus or the authority of Jesus is exercised within his functionality as the sota, the savior. The savior of the body. The savior of the church. The savior of his people. So, sota is functional. Jesus rose from the dead and became the sota of them that believe. He rose from the dead and became the savior of them that believe. Now, Ephesians 5.23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. He is the savior of the body. He is the sota of the body. Christ is the sota, the savior. Ephesians 5, 27. That he might present it to himself a glorious church. It is the job of the sota to present you to himself glorious. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. It is the responsibility of the sota to present you to himself a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. All right, so it deals with the fact that Jesus is the savior of the body. Verse 30 of the same chapter. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. We are members of his body. We have ministry to his body. All right? Now, so the believer is in the body of Christ. Meaning that Jesus is my savior. Him being my savior means he has an office. He has an office. I didn't get born again to depend on myself. I didn't get born again to preserve myself. I didn't get born again to ensure that I remain born again. It's not my responsibility. It's the job of the sota. 
is the function of the Savior. So I put my eternity in his hands. And the Sota is now in charge. Yeah. Remember what he said in John 10, 28. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. That is the Sota exercising his authority as a savior. I give unto them eternal life. Once they receive my eternal life, they shall never perish. Once they receive my eternal life, nobody can pluck them out of my hands. So now as the Sota, he stood up and he bragged. I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish and none shall pluck them. That's a commander speaking. So I'm not the one keeping myself. He is the one keeping me. Verse 29. My father which gave them me is greater than all and no man is able to pluck them out of my father's Give me 28 in amplified version. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never lose it or perish throughout the ages. They shall never lose it. Meaning, I will make everything that is needed to make them not lose it available. So all eternity, they shall never by any means be destroyed. And no one is able to snatch them out of my hand. No one is able. No one. That person's great grand ancestor has not been born. That can snatch them. It's called eternal security. From the office of the Sota. The reason why people are afraid of losing salvation is because they don't understand salvation. How can you lose what you did not acquire? Did you acquire it? You did it. So how can you lose it? You are not a party to the saving grace. It is the complete work of Christ. And it was offered to you free of charge. And you received it. The moment you received it, he took over. He's in charge now. He's in charge. Because it is the job of the, the Sota to ensure that even the people within his constituency remain lawful and abiding to the law of the land. It is the job of the Sota. When you hand over yourself to me, once I take hold of you, it's done. You cannot remove yourself and nobody can remove you. That's why it is called eternal salvation. Not temporal salvation. Glory to God. Alright, so let's examine the office of Jesus where he becomes a sota of salvation. Now in John chapter 1 verse 17 is the same way it was with Moses. For the law was given by Moses. The law was given by Moses. But grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So Moses is the lawgiver. Meaning Moses had awesome authority. Moses had awesome authority. He determined whatever happens to the Jewish people. In John 5 45, see Moses in the operation. Do not think that I will accuse you to the father. There is one that accuses you, even Moses, in whom you trust. The accuser is Moses, in whom all of you trust. This is Jesus talking. So he situates the law as Moses. Look at how powerful Moses was. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 1. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. It cannot make them perfect, but it, Moses was in charge. First Corinthians 10, 1 Corinthians 10.1 Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant, how that all our fathers were under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud. They were the baptized unto Moses. That's how powerful the man was. They were baptized unto Moses. Moses was a type of a savior for Israel. He was a type of Jesus. Just like we are baptized into Christ, they were baptized into Moses. God told Moses, take Israel out of Egypt to the promised land. He did. He brought them out. See Moses is in oppression. When God told him, go and take them out, did you see the oppression of Moses? Pharaoh, let my people go. Pharaoh said, who are you? <laughs> Moses said, you want to try me? 
Boom! He threw the rod down. He became a serpent and looked at Pharaoh. Pharaoh said, we can also do the same. He called magicians. Power versus power. The magicians came and were throwing their, all of them had snakes everywhere. Moses is on just ha! All the snakes ran in. Closed his mouth. Moses took it up and said, dust it. Let my people go. They were baptized into Moses. So you see how powerful a sota is. So you see how powerful a savior is. He said, let them go. The guy was playing games. Water turned to blood. Everywhere was blood. Even the water they were holding in their hand, when they checked, became blood. Moses. Some of you don't know Moses. The guy said, please, please, I will obey. Moses said, okay, water normalized. Water normalized. The guy said, you will not go. Frogs everywhere. People will be moving inside their trousers. Frogs are jumping. They say, oh, please. Moses said, frogs, stop. Frogs, stop. Moses. That's why Jesus said, do not think that I will accuse you. The one accusing you is Moses. The guy has power. One man. In one night, he said, all the firstborns in the land die. The angel of death used this authority and moved through the city and slaughtered all firstborns. In one night, every family cried. All firstborns died in each family. In the whole of the land of Egypt. Pharaoh said, go. When a sota uses his power, nothing can stop him. If nothing could stop Moses from bringing Israel out of Egypt, then you think anything will stop you from being with Christ? I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession. Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession. The apostle, Jesus, is your savior or the sota. No pastor is your savior. Salvation is by Jesus. The apostle and high priest. The word apostle means someone who was sent. A sent out apostolos. A sent out one. Jesus, the apostle. The sent out one. Now, please pay attention. Jesus is also called the son. In Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2. He is called the son. Once. Apostle. Once. Then he is called high priest and sacrifice more often. Apostle once, son once, but high priest and the sacrifice more often. Okay? He's called the high priest. He is called the sacrifice much more. Apostle once, son once. So when he said he was saint and apostle, he is more of a verb than a noun. The one that is sent. That is the high priest. He is the apostle. TKS rule of Bible interpretation. He is the apostle. That is the high priest. The apostle sent out is also the high priest. Jesus is the high priest of our profession. The word high priest refers to his sacrificial work. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens. He is passed into the heavens. The apostle sent out. Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our profession. So he is Jesus, the son of God, sent out. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 19 to 20. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered. Whither the forerunner is for us entered. Even Jesus, yes. made an high priest forever after the order made of Made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, he is called a forerunner. The word forerunner is a Greek word, prodrosmos, prodrosmos. That means to go before orders, for their sake. 
or he is a founder for you. Now the word high priest is used 123 times in New Testament Greek. High priest. Apostle goes, forerunner goes ahead of us. Apostle is sent out. High priest is used 123 times in New Testament Greek. It's the word Acherios, Acherios, A-R-C-H-E-R-E-U-S, Acherios, used 123 times. In the four Gospels, it's used 84 times. And none of them refers to Jesus in the four Gospels. In Acts of the Apostles, it's used 22 times. And none of it refers to Jesus, 22 times. In the book of Hebrews, it's the only epistle where it is used for Jesus in Hebrews. Brother Paul and Peter didn't use the word high priest for Jesus at all. All right? But it's in Hebrews because the book of Hebrews is a book of comparison between the Old Testament module and the finished work of Christ. It's a book of comparison, the book of Hebrews. Like I've told you before, the book of Hebrews was written by the writer of Hebrews to the Jews, trying to persuade the believing and the non believing Jews. To abandon the practices and rituals of the law and embrace Christ. So in doing that, there was comparison. He will talk about the shadow. He will talk about the reality. He will talk about the shadow. Then he will show them what that shadow represents in the reality. For example, Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1, God who at sundry times in diverse manners spake to the fathers. So God spake to the fathers of the Old Testament, the Jewish fathers, by the prophets hath in these last days spoken to us in his son. So what the prophets did to the fathers is what the son is doing to us. Comparison. In the second chapter, he talked about angels. All right? And then he talked about Jesus being a son and that none of the angels can compare with Christ. In the third chapter, he talked about Moses, a servant, and Jesus, a son. And he shows the superiority of Jesus over Moses. The whole book of Hebrews is comparison. So that's why the writer of Hebrews kept using high priest, high priest, high priest because high priest was known as an Old Testament practice. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 1. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. All right. High priest offers gifts and sacrifices for sin. Hebrews 7, 27, 28. Who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's? For this he did once when he offered up himself. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity, but the word of the oath which was since the law maketh the son who is consecrated forevermore. Maketh the son who is consecrated forevermore. Keep taking note of the word high priest because the word high priest is used 17 times in the book of Hebrews, primarily for Jesus. Hebrews 8, 3. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. Hebrews 9, 25. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. The priesthood of Jesus is the post-resurrection life of Jesus. The priesthood of Jesus is the post-resurrection life of Jesus. The post-resurrection life. He wasn't called high priest before he died. And his death was not called high priest. His death was not called high priest. His burial was not called high priest. It's only his resurrection that refers to him as high priest. Only his resurrection. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 4 to 6. And no man taketh this hour honor unto himself, but he that is called of God as was Aaron. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. As he saith also is another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, is this rendition, incarnation, or resurrection. Huh? Resurrection. Who else? You all agree it's resurrection? Huh? Okay, how many of you don't agree it's resurrection? When it, the scripture said, Thou art my beloved son, this day have I begotten thee. 
Was that incarnation or resurrection? Exactly. That was resurrection. All right? Now, it's important to know that. That was after he rose. He was referred to as this day about the God in thee. That was when he became high priest. The priesthood of Jesus was upon his resurrection. All right? Please, that's very important. Hebrews 4.14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens. So the high priest is passed into the heavens. Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our profession. He is passed into the heavens, meaning he became a high priest after he rose from the dead. Resurrection. That's when he became high priest. And he's a priest after the order of Melchizedek, which was a prophecy in Psalm 110 verse 1. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. Verse 4. The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Brother Paul stayed with verse 1. While the writer of Hebrews stayed with verse 4. So you will see verse 1 repeated by brother Paul in his writings. But you will see verse 4 repeated by the writer of Hebrews. Now let's look at the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews 5.10. Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. After the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews 6.20. Whither the forerunner is for us entered. Even Jesus made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews 7.17. 7, for he testifieth. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. After the order of Melchizedek, Hebrews 7.21. For those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Why does he call him after that order? First of all, what do priests do? Priests offer sacrifices on behalf of others. All right? The word priest is the Greek word herios, H-E-I-R-E-U-S. They offer on behalf of others. Use 31 times. Use 31 times. In the four gospels, 11 times. In Acts of the Apostles, three times. And none of them refers to Jesus. But in Hebrews, 14 times, priest. In the book of Revelation, three times. Now look at Hebrews 9 verse 6. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service the of The priests, the Herios, they went ahead. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 11. And every priest standeth daily, ministering and offering All of this times. refers to the Old Testament. Oftentimes. The same sacrifices, which can never which take Which can sin. never. If your Bible was mine, I will underline never. Which can never take away sins. So the function of the priests was to offer sacrifices. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 2. To whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Which is king of peace. Verse 20. And inasmuch as not without an oath, he was made priest. He was made a priest. Hebrews 7 23. And they truly were many priests, because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. They were not suffered to continue because the Old Testament priests used to die by reason of death. Hebrews 7, 15. And it is yet far more evident, for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest. There ariseth another priest. Hebrews 7, 11. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? He was not called after the order of Aaron. He was called after the order of Melchizedek. So the arrival of the priesthood of Jesus buried the priesthood of Aaron. It shut down Levi and closed down the Levitical priesthood and messed up with that order. Why? Because nobody was allowed to be a priest that was not from the family of Levi. Jesus came from the family of Judah. The tribe of Judah. Judah and Levi have nothing in common. Yet, out of Judah, a priest was ordained. Meaning, the law was cancelled. Do you understand? The law holds no water anymore. 
the Levitical priesthood and all the practices that attended that priesthood collapsed. Jesus now brought a new priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. Why was it after the order of Melchizedek? Because Melchizedek was a type of the priest of righteousness. And Jesus is our righteousness. Righteousness devoid of works. That's why under the order of Melchizedek, Abraham was righteous without works. No works. He just believed. And under Jesus, no works. We just believe because he's a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Because Melchizedek was a type of Jesus in priesthood. Look at that Hebrews 7 verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem. Now some people have told you Melchizedek was not a human being. is a lie. Melchizedek was a proper human being. He was actually the king of Jerusalem. King of Salem. The word Salem is a short form of Jerusalem. He was a physical king. Melchizedek was a physical king over a community called Jerusalem. Melchizedek was just a type. Just like Isaac was a human being. And he was used to demonstrate the sacrificial work of Christ as a type. That's why God didn't allow Abraham to kill Isaac. Because of what benefit will the death of Isaac be? It's like you're acting a drama. And in the drama you're supposed to die. And then the person that is supposed to kill you did not realize it's a drama. And he loaded the gun. Fully armed. And as he cocked the gun, AK-47, instead of the gun to just do boom, and nothing comes out, they now realize that gun is cocked and it has bullets. So the director of the movie say, cut, 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 cut. Bring that gun, let us see. Then they pull out the magazine, it's full. They will have killed the man. That is a drama. You are not supposed to kill the man. You are supposed to act it. So all the types were actors acting a script for the reality. So that we in the reality, if we are looking for some details we can't find, we go back to the script. So Melchizedek was not Jesus. He was acting a type. Isaac was acting a type of us. You see? Isaac was to die. In his place, a ram died. We are like Isaac. We are supposed to die. The ram is a type of Jesus. In our place, Jesus died. So Isaac was just acting. He was not the real deal. That's why the Bible says, in Isaac shall your seed be called. He didn't say Isaac is your seed. He said, your seed is inside Isaac. Meaning, Isaac is a typology. For when this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. He met Abraham returning from the slaughter of kings and blessed him. So the office of the priest or high priest was a function. Their function primarily was to offer sacrifice on behalf of the people. Priests act for others. To be able to see the imperfection of the law, look at Hebrews chapter 7 verse 3. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the made Son of God. Made like, made like, metaphor. Abideth a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. And verily they that are of the sons of Levi, who received the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of their people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. So, these guys who were the priests were chosen to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. Then they are to offer for themselves. That's their limitation. They offer for people, but before they offer for you, they offer for themselves first because they themselves needed a high priest. The Old Testament priest needed a priest. That was their limitation. So when they are offering sacrifice to cover the sins of the people, they offered for themselves first because they were not sinless. Then after they have offered for themselves, they now offer for the people. That was the limitation of the priesthood of the Old Testament. 
And that further shows you that it was just a metaphor. So he doesn't just offer for others. He offers for himself also. Why? Because their office in the Old Testament cannot save. The Old Testament priests could not save anybody. Why? Because he himself needed a high priest. In Hebrews 7.21, you will see it clearly stated. For those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent. They were made without an oath. All right? No oath. But Jesus' priesthood came out of an oath. Number one, they offered for themselves first before offering for you. That's the limitation. Number two, they were priests without an oath. Number three, Hebrews 7.27. Who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's? For this he did once when he offered up himself. So every year these people were offering sacrifices because the ones they offered didn't have what it takes to take away sin. Hebrews 9, 7. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. Which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. So take these points down. Number one, it was an imperfect priesthood. Imperfect. It was an imperfect priesthood, the Old Testament priesthood. Number two, they offered sacrifice for himself first. He offered sacrifice for himself first. Number three, he does it once every year. Now please notice Moses. Hebrews 9.19. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people. Moses, a guy. So after Moses finished speaking the words of the law, he will now take blood, take water, put together, take wool, touch the water and sprinkle on the people <laughs> all over the place. But he himself does not sprinkle himself. He never sprinkled himself, but he sprinkled every one of them. Why? He's a boss. He's a soldier. What he has told them does not affect him, only affects them. If you read the Bible, you will see Moses is a standalone. Beginning at Moses and the prophets, see him powerful. Because he was the servant over his house. So, what he was simply telling them is that this priesthood does not have any eternal value. I just set it up for you people to help you. But it has no eternal value. That's why he didn't sprinkle the blood on himself. Because he knew that those blood could not take away sin. It was just a ritual done pointing to the original that is coming in Christ. So the Old Testament couldn't offer something perfect. All right? Hebrews 10, 11. And every priest standeth daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away Moses sin. Moses knew that those sacrifices could never take away sin. He knew it. But in order to keep the people in the same place and keep communicating the death of Christ to them, he gave them all the rituals to see that if per adventure by any of the ritualistic practice, they may understand salvation. It was Moses' attempt to bring Christ to the people. Praise the Lord. Hebrews 4.14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. We have a high priest that is passed into the heavens. Seeing we have. Somebody say very loud with me, I have a high priest that is passed to the heavens. Yeah. Look at Hebrews 7, 26, 27. For such an high priest became us. He became us. Who is holy. Holy. Harmless. Harmless. Undefiled. Undefiled. Separate from sinners. He is not a sinner. And made higher than the heavens. Made higher than the heavens. Who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. To show you the perfection of what Jesus did, he didn't have to be offering sacrifice every year. He just offered once and forever. That settled it. One job. In the Old Testament, every year, every year, because of the imperfection of the priesthood and the imperfection of the system. But this man, 
This man, my sota, my savior, my salvation. Glory to God. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14. In Jesus' case, he didn't offer animal. He himself was a sacrifice. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirits offered himself he without offered He offered himself. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. He offered himself. So this high priest of the New Testament, the high priest is the sacrifice. The high priest is the sacrifice. Hebrews 9, 26, 28 for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. Yes. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin. By to the put sacrifice. away sin. How? By the sacrifice, By the of, sacrifice himself. of himself. He is the sacrifice and he is the high priest. Perfect. Hebrews 10, 10. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. How many times did he offer his body? Once, once, he is not just offering something like the Old Testament priest. He offers himself. He is a sacrifice and the high priest. The Old Testament can never take away sin. But Jesus once offered himself. And that once took care of sin forever. Can somebody shout hallelujah? So Jesus is a priest forever. He's not a priest for some time. He's like the son of God. He abides forever. His office is done by him. He's the sealant of his office. In the Old Testament, the priest standard daily to offer. In Jesus' case, he sat down. While the Old Testament priests have to stand because their work never finished, in Jesus' case, he sat down and offered, meaning it is done. He sat down. Old Testament priest stands. Jesus' work, perfect. How can you be under Jesus' work and be afraid of losing salvation? Then you don't understand the work. He sat down. Finished the work. The work of Christ. Eternally finished. Your salvation, eternally finished. Eternal life for you, eternally settled. Eternally settled. This man, we have a God-like man or a man like God. This man, he sat down. Hebrews 1.3. Who being the brightness of his glory yes. and the express image of his person yes. and upholding all things by the word of his power. Yes. When he had by himself purged our sins, yes. sat down on the right hand of the mad. After purging our sin, what did he do? He sat down. When he sat down, what was he saying? The believer's sin is eternally purged. Purged. He sat down. He didn't stand. Once he finished purging, he sat down. Hebrews 10, 12. But this man. This man. After he has offered one sacrifice. One sacrifice for sins. Forever. Forever. What did he do? Sat down on sat the right down hand. Sat down on the right hand of God. Somebody shout glory. <laughs> Hebrews 8 1. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Who is set on the right hand. We have a high priest who is sitting down. Hebrews 12 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand he of the throne of God. He is set down. He said, don't look at the priest that is standing. Look at Jesus, the priest who has sat down. Stop wasting your time looking at the priest that is still standing. Mm -mm. Look at Jesus, the high priest who offered himself and has sat down. Finished work. Finished work. My job is to enjoy what Christ has provided. Oh, hallelujah. Looking unto Jesus, 
the altar. Hebrews 10, 11, 12, 14. And every priest standeth daily. They stand daily. Ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away Which, sins. if your Bible was my own, I will underline that which can never take away. They gave the sacrifices, they killed the animals, they did everything, yet he could not take away sin. You know, that's what David understood. David looked at God and said, God, I know I have killed somebody. I know I have killed somebody. And I know that I have collected his wife. I killed the husband. I collected the wife. Not only collected the wife, she's pregnant with my baby. But against thee, and thee only, have I sinned. That guy is bold. Against thee, and thee only, have I sinned, and done this wicked. I know you, you don't want animal sacrifice. If it's animal sacrifice you want, I am the king of Israel. All the animals in Israel I will offer. But I know you have never delighted in animal sacrifice, even though that's a practice. But I have foreseen the New Testament. I've seen the work of Christ in prophecy. And I know that the only sacrifice that pleases you is a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Are you following? And God just forgave him. God not only forgave him, God bragged. I found David, a man after my heart. Is God saying David did right? No. He didn't do right. Of course, there were consequences that he suffered physically. True or false? He suffered a lot of things physically, but with God, everything was fine. It's like a man that goes to steal. And they catch him. And he says, Father, thank you that I am eternally forgiven. My sins, past, present, and future are forgiven, but police are holding his hand. <laughs> then they start beating him. Poor, 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 poor. Is he forgiven? Yes. But police are not forgiven him. <laughs> poor. They use gun. Boom. Blood is coming out. Thank you, Father. I'm forgiven. What did you say? Boom. With God, it's done. Eternally forgiven. But with the government of Nigeria, the journey has just started. They throw him inside cell. In far from cell, they put him inside prison. When he entered prison, the prison coordinator told him, bring rent. What did you do? Bring rent. He said, I don't have rent. They gave him another beating. They beat him till he fainted. His sins are forgiven. He went to heaven as a young boy. That's why if you read the Ten Commandments very carefully, the Ten Commandments are summarized in two things. Love God, love your neighbor. Because there are consequences for action on the earth. There are consequences. You can't go free with everything. But eternal judgment is taken away by the death of Christ. This man, after he has offered how many sacrifices? One sacrifice for sins forever. What did he do? He sat down. He has sat down. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's settled. Eternity for you in Christ is settled. You have eternal life. You have eternal redemption. You have eternal inheritance. You are complete in Christ Jesus. And on that basis, you have authority on the earth. I didn't hear your amen. Well, if you're blessed, stand on your feet. Turn to your neighbor. Say, blessed. Say, neighbor, neighbor, look at me or look at me. Look at me very quickly. You are looking at the most righteous man on the planet. No record of sin. Eternally forgiven. Accepted by God. Blessed. 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 Say with me, I am in authority. Over principalities, powers, demons, evil spirits, they are under my feet. I am in charge. I rule over them. I have immortality in my mortality. I have the abundance of grace, which is the gift of righteousness. I reign in life. I thought I would hear better. Amen. 
Lift your right hand. I declare and I declare over you as your amen will come like thunder, standing on the finished work of Christ. Whatever does not look like the perfection of Christ around you, I command it to expire. Amen. Sickness and disease melt and dissolve. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke challenges. I rebuke harassments. I rebuke the voice of the enemy. In the name of Jesus. And I decree for some of you here that have made certain mistakes and you've been going through certain natural repercussions by the finished work of Christ right now, I command the mercy of God to overrule every situation. In the name of Jesus. Receive mercy. Receive mercy. Receive mercy. Hey, I said receive mercy. He said, let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. When mercy smiles on a man, judgment is cancelled. Some of you have made some decisions that have landed you in trouble. And some of you have taken some steps that have made life unbearable for you. I sense in my spirit to pray for such people in this service. I speak over you today on the finished work of Christ. Every decision, every mistake you have made that have made life unbearable for you. As your amen will come like thunder, receive the mercy of God. 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 Mercy of God. In that business, in that career, in that marriage, in that life decision, I say receive the mercy of God. I cancel the hold of judgment, the harassment of the devil. I cancel the harassment of the devil. Every injustice hanging over your life, I command it aborted. 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 Ah, he said, let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help. Receive help. Receive help. Gatana, Gatana, Gatana. Gatana, Gatana, Gatana. Lebato Nakata. Some of you have no business struggling. Certain decisions landed you in struggle. Some of you have no business struggling the way you're struggling. By the mercy of God. Lebayonagaga. I speak from the throne of grace. As your amen will come like thunder. Mercy cancels judgment. Mercy cancels judgment. Stagnation is cancelled by mercy. Frustration is cancelled by mercy. Frustration is cancelled by mercy. Receive a miracle. Receive a miracle. Receive restoration. Receive a miracle. By the finished work of Christ. Batola Yakato, Egreya Nokaya, Merika Doreya, Meroda Zobara, Barako Tenega, Ageya, Ageya, Ageya. As your amen will come like thunder, every devil's harassment is cancelled in your life. Receive divine intervention. Receive divine intervention. Receive divine solution. Receive divine direction. Receive divine intervention. Receive it in the name of Jesus. It is done. This week, I command you to harvest testimonies. Harvest testimonies. Harvest testimonies. Harvest testimonies. Those papers you're waiting for to be signed, they are signed right now. Those checks you're waiting for, they are signed right now. That job is approved right now. That offer is approved right now. As your amen is coming like thunder, receive supply. Receive supply. I say receive supply. In the name of Jesus. It is done. 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 In Jesus precious name. Can your amen come on a note of finality? Well go ahead and celebrate the victory of Christ. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. Oh my goodness, what a time we had learning and being equipped with the word of God. I'm sure you found what you came to look for on my page. I'm sure you found it today. It's so critical because that's the whole essence. But particularly, my mission here is to unveil Christ so that the believer's identity is revealed. So you can rise to your fullness in Christ. Be equipped as a minister. Be equipped as a believer and be equipped to do the work of ministry so that the body of Christ can be edified. I'm excited that you're blessed today. Don't go away, please. Don't go away. I want to encourage you. If you don't have any church you belong to, maybe you've not found a church where the message of Christ is taught or you are in a church where the message of Christ is not taught and now you're looking for a place to belong to. 
two things. Number one, we have campuses. And I want to recommend that you join one of our campuses. You know, because the campus is an extension of our local church here. Where you're fed, equipped, where you join other believers of like faith. You grow together, a company of yours. You grow together, you mature together. You bring in new converts, you disciple them and watch them grow in the knowledge of Christ. That's what the campus unveils for you. If you live in a city where there's no campus and there's no Christ-centered church, you can start one. We're equipping you to start one. And today, if you want to start one in your locality, all you need to do is shoot me a mail, Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. We will get in touch with you, train you, equip you, and make it easy for you to start a local church and be a lighthouse where other people in your community can come, be fed the message, grow in the knowledge of Christ, and expand the kingdom of God. I'm excited, friends. What a joy to be a blessing. As you keep enjoying the broadcast, remember, we are live every day here on Facebook, in the morning, 6 a.m. on YouTube, Christocentric Mail, in the afternoon, 12 p.m. GMT plus one here on the page, and 10 p.m. GMT plus one here on the page. And for those of you within the whole of Africa, I want to encourage you to get the decoders. We have our TV channel. It's called Kingdom Life Network. The details are on the screen on how you can scan your decoders and locate Kingdom Life Network. What a joy. In Kingdom Life Network, all we have there is the message of Christ 247. Everything there is Christ-centered. It's on free-to-air decoder or my TV decoder or strong decoder. You can find the channel there. You don't pay subscription. It's free. Help us tell other people about this too because the channel covers the whole of Africa effectively and parts of Europe and parts of Asia. It's important. Let's flood the blue marble planet with the fragrance of Jesus' grace. I'm looking forward to serve you grace as we meet in the next broadcast. And until then, enjoy the grace of Christ and be blessed. Amen.